Um, so before I start, uh, a few announcements. So there's going to be, uh, I think on the schedule right now, I have a night lab scheduled for this week. Uh, that's canceled for this week, uh, partly because it's not looking like it's going to be great weather most of the week. Um, but also, I'm actually observing uh, overnight on sort of the nights that we would actually have the lab. So it's hard to balance both. So uh, I'm going to postpone anything for this week, and we'll, and we'll move that to next week. Um, You'll have your project proposals back by Thursday. I will probably have suggestions for most of you about how to sort of focus your project or focus the creative part of your project if you're doing that or even focus the presentation part. Um, most of all, I'm really liking the ideas I'm seeing so far, so that's good. Um, but uh, I would say, you know, hold off before going into writing the entire thing this week, which I don't think you were going to do uh, before I get back to you on Thursday. Okay, I'll have some specific suggestions then. Uh, and then homework six is now online if you want to download that and start working on that. That'll be done, due not Monday, May 11th, which was yesterday. Good luck finishing that. Uh, the due Monday, May 18th. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so we've got two uh, news reports today, Daniel. So uh, the sheets they hand out, go ahead and just tear them in half so you can have one for each speaker. So Daniel Hernandez is going to talk about water delivery. Yeah, so the article is about water deli delivery via asteroids and comets, and so like how it's believed that the Earth shot its oceans was from water-rich comets and asteroids, which hit it and then gave it all the, the water in the ocean. And so there's a lot of, it suggests there's a lot of plan planetary bodies that contain large amounts of water comparable to the size of, to the amounts of that it's in Earth. And so, there's a lot of, there's a possible for other Earth like planets to create life, but this possibly is the water, having that water. And so, like the water delivery via asteroids and comets is likely taking place in many other planetary systems. And it's not, not unique to the solar system, the water rich asteroids. Um, and so, these scientists from the university, uh, university in the UK, uh, used the William Herschel Telescope in the Canary Islands, and they spotted a white dwarf, and it contained significant amount of hydrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere. And so they believe that, well, the reason there's hydrogen and oxygen was because a water-rich uh, asteroid hit it, which then when an uh, asteroid hits it, it impacts, the impact mixes hydrogen and oxygen, which creates that hydrogen oxygen in the atmosphere. And so, and this white dwarf is the comparable to the size of Ceres. And um, the white dwarf had 30 to 35% of water that, of the water of the ocean on Earth. And um, well, the the reason why the, in, what was detected was the hydrogen, because the hydrogen is a lighter element. Therefore, before like it, it floats more on the surface, whereas oxygen is the heavier, so it'll go down more and it'll disappear, end up disappearing. And so, yeah, and so like it just gives the possibility of life to be with the formation of life beyond Earth. Okay, questions? Two questions. Yes, please. So, like, how far is the white this white dwarf? From right yeah, now? I tried to look it up, and it didn't, didn't say in the release. No, I didn't. Oh, well, I didn't. See, I didn't see. I looked it up. I looked up like there's the scientific name. It's like taking like this long. So, mm -hmm. I tried to look up the location. Okay. Sure. okay. Sure. All right. What was the name of the source? Uh, well, it's from the Science Daily, and then it derived uh, from the an actual, like a journal publication from the University of Warwick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any question? Yeah. Um, how many comets or asteroids to make like the Earth's motions? How many? For like a lot. Well, you think I'm, of it a lot. Oh, I'm, I suppose that'll take more than one, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I don't know, specific answer for that. 
Well, you said how much was how much of the was this was this? You said how many how many uh, like how, how many yeah. actually would it take would to it build take to, like, yeah. to build an ocean? Or like make an ocean like other planets too, I guess. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, what fraction did you say that this this particular impact? Well, I said that it was 32, 35 percent of the water of the ocean. Okay. In honor. Okay. So how many of those would have to hit to get all the oceans on the Earth? So like three or four. Yeah, it's three or four, not many. At least if they're this big. So that that question is if it's a, a usual or abnormal large asteroid. Now you said that the white dwarf was the size of Ceres, or was the in thing that hit the white dwarf the size of Ceres? No, I said the, the white dwarf was was the size of Ceres. Uh, I think it's probably the thing that hit the white dwarf. It's, uh, do, does anybody know what a white dwarf is? Has anyone heard that that term? What's a white dwarf? It's uh, Type of a star, and yeah. uh, it's either a very new star or a very old star, or is it just a really small star? So, as if it's a little small star, whether it's new or old is a good question. Okay. <laughs> Depends where you count from. So, uh, a white dwarf is the remnant core of a star that has burned all of its hydrogen away. Um, we haven't talked a lot about the star sort of evolution process. That was one of the things that we just don't have time to talk about everything in astronomy, so I didn't talk about that. Um, but a star like our sun eventually will run out of hydrogen in its, in its core as it's burnt, you know, fusing that hydrogen to helium eventually runs out of hydrogen. And at that point, it will blow off its atmosphere. And what you're left with is essentially the core of the star that's just exposed, mostly made out of helium. And it's actually about the size of the Earth. That's that's set by physics. So I think the thing that hit the white dwarf or actually probably got torn apart by the white dwarf was the thing was the side of Ceres, yeah. But the white dwarf itself is usually about the size of the Earth, about the mass of the sun, but about the size of the Earth, which means it's incredibly dense. Some of the densest objects that we know in the universe are, are white dwarfs or remnants of stars in general. In fact, there's one, uh, one of the most famous white dwarfs is the companion to the star Sirius, which you can see in the sky right now, the brightest stars in the sky. And it has a very tiny little faint star that you can only see with really good telescopes or the Hubble Space Telescope. And that star is actually brighter or hotter at surface than the, than the big star that's next to it. So it's a very unusual type of object. And if this was a stellar astrophysics course, we'd spend a whole day on it, but we're not going to. So. OK. Thank you. Thank you much, Daniel. OK, so please give Daniel some uh, feedback on both the slide and the presentation. Um, OK, and then Andres Padilla. We'll be talking about 51 peg B. OK, so I uh, did my um, news report on 51 peg B. Uh, basically, it's the first time they've ever detected an actual light spectrum from an exoplanet, which means they basically were able to find the reflected light from the sun uh, from the planet. So what they do is they take the spectrum of the sun and they filter it until they can find uh, an optical spectrum in the range of what the planet's gonna be. Um, over here, you can see this chart. I think it's peaked around 132 kilometers per second. And that's actually pretty close to the radial velocity of the actual planet. So some background on 51 peg B um, it was actually the first exoplanet found orbiting um, a main sequence star, uh, much like our own. Um, that was in 1995. Um, it's a hot Jupiter, and that means that it's um, very similar to Jupiter, except that it orbits very close to the sun. I think it has um, closest as 0.5 AU, so even closer than Venus. It's even closer than that. It is? Yeah. Oh, really? Somewhere around 0.05 or 0.01. 0.05. So it's closer, than, okay. closer than Mercury. Oh. It's a real hot. Well, that explains why it's so hot. It actually had, reaches a temperature of about uh, 1,200 Kelvin, I think. So it's incredibly hot. Um, yeah, so what, how to get so close? Like, that doesn't make sense, right? How do you have a Jupiter so close? So a theory is that it formed beyond the frost line, but then it started to migrate inward after um, until it reached a stable orbit, which was really close. Um, let's 
So from the data they found, they could determine um, the mass and the orbital inclination. I think the mass was about half of Jupiter and it has about twice the radius. Um, the, the orbital inclination was about nine degrees. So it's edge on to when we look at it. So there are other methods of exoplanet detection like radio velocity, you know, try to see like the wobbling of a star from other planets orbiting it, transit for tropical Geometry, which is a planet passes in front of the star, and then there's like a little dip in intensity, and transmission spectroscopy, where the atmosphere of a planet filters the sunlight, and you can tell what that atmosphere is made of. So the advantages um, this technique has over the other ones is that you work in the optical spectrum, so you avoid the thermal emission, and uh, you can get the reflectivity or albedo. Um, which is how much it reflects. And you can actually determine the chemical composition of the planet from that. Um, disadvantages. So I think it only it's only useful for really big planets that are like close to the sun and can actually reflect light from it. Um, so yeah, we're eventually going to need better equipment that has better resolution where you can actually see smaller planets that are more farther away. Okay, and Grace, questions? Yes. Uh, all right, did you say the mass or the density was? The mass. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, oh the mass is half yeah. of that Jupiter? So it has half Jupiter mass at uh, twice the radius. Is it Jupiter is mostly hydrogen, right? Or helium? Mostly hydrogen and helium, yeah, but mostly, yeah, mostly hydrogen. So do you think this planet is mostly hydrogen then? What do like, they say? If it's half um, the mass, but twice the radius, then. I think it's similar. I don't, I don't recall. Yeah. Okay, so they, they probably didn't say because they probably didn't have enough yeah, data from the spectrum data. to determine. So, you know, we, we talked a little bit about when we talked about different types of planets that you can estimate their densities and figure out what they're made out of. Um, it turns out that, and we'll talk about this more on Thursday, but Jupiter and Saturn actually have average densities about one gram per cubic centimeter, which sounds like it's like what substance? Yeah, like water, right? Water is one gram per cubic centimeter. But the funny thing about gas that's different from what liquids and solids is that you can compress gas to really high densities because it's just gas, like it, it squeezes. So the average density of a gas planet like Jupiter is about one gram per cubic centimeter. These kind of planets, we can also figure out their densities based on things like the transit technique, which we'll talk about later on. Um, and that's how we kind of infer what their radii are. Um, it turns out you know, some of these planets are much bigger than Jupiter. And it probably has to do with the fact that they're so close to their stars. You know, they're going to be sort of heated up, pumped up in some way by, by the extra heat that's coming in. Actually, nobody really understands that completely. So that's one of the mysteries about exoplanets that people are still thinking about. It makes sense, though, because the molecules are hotter than they yeah, probably like, don't want to condense as much. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Tatiana? Well, my question kind of jumps off the page about how. Um, do you know if the technique they're using is penetrating into the atmosphere, or is it just reflecting off? I mean, yeah, it's just reflecting off the planet. The atmosphere? So do, do they have any info on, like, if the atmosphere is too thick that the, the camp penetrates the surface? Yeah, so the albedo that I mentioned, if that's high enough, I think you can infer stuff about the atmosphere. And I think they got an albedo of 0.5, so I don't know what that means exactly. But Well, so the tricky thing about these gas giant planets is there's really no surface to look at. Yeah. It's all it's all gas all the way in. And in fact, um, you know, we talked a little bit about how the giant planets form on Thursday, that they'd have to start from solid things like ice. So lots of ice then starts to create gas. We now think that that ice that may have started Jupiter is probably evaporated away already. So there's nothing solid inside Jupiter. Um, although when you get to high enough pressures, it's kind of a funky gas. We'll talk about that a little bit Thursday as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, do they plan to like uh, put them, like put the fifty-one peg pegs, basically, um, into the solar system, like for our galaxy, or no? Uh, like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, are they gonna put like put it because like in the border of like Earth, like like Saturn, Jupiter, or whatever, but like because it's really really close to the sun, they're gonna put it in like the order of it, or? Oh, are you asking if fifty-one peg is part of our solar system? Yeah. Are they planted? No. 
Or the planet going off? I don't think so. Okay. Now this is a planet around another star. Yeah, this is uh, a okay. different star. Yeah, this star orbits uh, 51 uh, Pegasi. Mm -hmm. Basically, the name comes from uh, Pegasi. It's located in the Pegasus constellation. Mm -hmm. And then um, B, um, that refers to the first exoplanet they find orbiting this star. And then 51, I believe, is the distance away from us. So it's 51 light years away, roughly. Mm, it's or actually the 51st brightest star in Pe Pegasus. Okay. It's also 51 light years. That may just be a coincidence. I think it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's usually it's the 51st. So anytime you see like, okay, I mean, you see, often you'll see things like Alpha Centauri. Alpha is the first, right? Alpha is first letter in Greek alphabet. That's the brightest star in Centauri. Right? Stuff like that. And then once they get past all the Greek letters, they start getting numbers. So, so that actually I never noticed that. It's an interesting coincidence that it's the same. Yeah. Okay. Number, but all right. Yeah, I didn't find any data on the name mm -hmm. or the numbers. So. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. This question is like related to Jupiter. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, does, am I correct in like the density should get greater as you go toward the center of Jupiter? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so, how come the center doesn't become like liquid or? Well, it's partly because it's hydrogen, and hydrogen behaves, uh, it doesn't condense like heavier elements. Um, it does form a kind of unusual fluid. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, on Thursday when we talk about the interiors of, of Jupiter and Saturn. Um, the short answer is that that hydrogen turns into a metallic gas, which we don't have anything like in our normal environment. But that's because it's extremely high pressures uh, at the center of these really big planets. You know, of the order of like, you know, 100,000 times the atmosphere pressure here. So it's it's dense. But we'll we'll talk about we'll talk about that a little later. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Andreas. So if you have any comments for Andreas on his presentation and his slide, um, remember this is sort of helping us to prepare for uh, our final presentations as well. Okay. So, um, and I should say, like, we'll talk a lot more about exoplanets. Uh, I think probably in week eight, week nine, starting to talk about sort of worlds around other stars. Um, yeah, if you want to hand the sheets over, that would be great. Thank you. Um, but the idea of, you know, the, these sort of unusual planets that are nothing like our solar system is something that's going to inform our sort of new understanding of how solar systems work. So on Thursday, we talked about the patterns of our own solar system and how those conform sort of our model of how our solar system was created in the first place. And so just to remind everyone, all right, the, some of the patterns we had is that almost all of the mass of the solar system is in the middle, in the sun, 99.9% .9 of it. Um, we have these sort of patterns of rocky inner planets and gassy outer planets and icy bodies that are sort of scattered out much further from that. Obviously, 51 peg breaks this pattern, right? Not the same as our solar system. The gas planets are on the outside, and this gas planet is closer than Mercury. That's a completely different pattern. So we'll talk about how that changes our idea of how solar systems form uh, in a couple weeks. Um, we know that oh, they all over in the same plane, called the ecliptic plane, in the same direction. That they mostly rotate in the same direction, although there's some interesting um, deviants like Venus, which we'll talk about a little bit today. Uh, the large moons mostly orbit in the same direction as well. So there seems to be this preferential sort of flat spinning disk kind of structure that seems to underline all the solar system. Uh, and that, of course, sort of informs the sort of model we have for the solar system, the solar nebula model. And in fact, our solar system started as a big disk of gas that was rotating around our star, and our planets condensed out of that. Right? And you know where those planets, how those planets condensed, determined is based a lot on this frost line that Andreas uh, referred to. Um, that if you are inside this frost line, the environment is too hot to have ices. And so the only solids you have available to you are rocks and metals. You end up making rock metal planets, which are mostly small because rocks and metals are rare in the universe. Whereas if you're outside the frost line, the solid materials you have are now, now include ices. And there's a lot more ices in the universe because the elements that make up ice are much more common in the universe. So you can make bigger planets, and those planets can accrete lots of gas. They can make their own little solar systems, which are the moons around these planets. So you get this sort of pattern built up just from this relatively simple picture. But as Andreas sort of alluded to, we're going to probably have to break that picture when we talk about other exoplanet systems. All right, so 
Uh, but today I want to focus on these guys because the point of this class is, of course, to look at life in the universe. And so let's start in the places where we know that life is. We know life is here on Earth. What are the other planets that are in the solar system? And could they also have life or have had life in some point in their past? What are the sort of conditions required for that? So we'll talk about habitability, and then we'll talk about Mars and Venus in particular. Mercury itself is a really interesting planet. It's just not very interesting for life. It's just much too hot. It's always been much too hot. So we think that that's probably not a place that we expect to see life. So I'm not going to talk really at all about Mercury, but um, you know, it's an interesting planet if you want to get to know it on your own. Um, so we'll focus on Mars and Venus, and we'll see why in a second. So uh, we've talked about you know the required qualities of life. Um, we have these sort of six sort of uh, processes that are common for life. All right, order, energy usage. What else we got? I'm not going to say them all. I want to growth, and about them. growth and development. Evolution. Evolution. Response, and environment. Response to the environment. Well, we're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> was it genetics? So order, energy usage, response to the environment, reproduction, reproduction evolution. I think actually we got it all. Okay. There's one more. Growth and development. Growth and development. Okay. So all those things are common processes to life. But if we really want to look at what life needs to do those processes, it's actually even a shorter list. The real three main things are energy, because it uses energy, so you have to have energy to use. Uh, water turns out to be critical for all life forms on Earth. We talked a little bit about extremophiles, like organisms that can survive in really extreme environments. But there are no extreme dry species. Right? Every species on the planet, every, even down in the smallest little bug, needs water to survive, to grow, and even to live. And so water seems to be a very important thing, at least for life on Earth. And of course, our sort of chomps elements, the sort of six elements that make up 98% of all life, obviously those elements need to be around for their life to would like to be around. Um, and then this down here, interfaces and stability, we won't talk about this too much, but the idea that you know interfaces are where you have, for example, a, a solid and a gas, right, the surface of the planet, or a solid and a liquid, all right, some place where you have a change in environment, a gradient in the environment, we see that life thrives at these gradients. Right? And then stability, making sure that the planet or the environment that we're in stays the same for long periods of time because Life takes a long time to develop through Darwinian evolution. So you need to have some stability to your, your environment to do this. Now, we'll focus on water a little bit because uh, water seems to be a very specific thing to have in this list. And so why is water so important? Um, I'm not sure if I can talk about this in great detail yet. But um, you know, there's a couple properties of water that make it really essential for the processes that life undertakes. Uh, one of the things that maybe doesn't seem uh, important right off the bat is this a very unusual property that water ice floats in water liquid, right? Almost any other substance that goes from liquid to solid gets denser when it goes to liquid to solid, all right? The bonds get tighter, right? You get a stricter crystalline form, and that makes something that sinks in its own liquid. You know, so if you have ammonia solids, for example, which exist down at very low temperatures, right? All that just settles down to the bottom of a liquid glass. Now, why is that important? Well, if the ice stays up on top, the cold part stays up on top, it actually serves as sort of an insulation for the liquid underneath. And so, you know, I don't, have any of you ever ice fished before? Wow, cool. <laughs> I have because I'm from the Northeast. This is all we do in the winter, right? Nothing else <laughs> do, right? But, you know, you drill a hole in the ice, and there's all sorts of living things down there, right? They're perfectly happy because the water has stayed at sort of a sub-frozen temperature. Uh, and it stayed liquid. And so that requires to have some sort of insulating powder, part of this, this insulating liquid. And the fact that ice, ice is a solid floats on top of liquid is an unusual property that really helps, uh, helps the liquid actually stay liquid at low temperatures. Um, the other thing about water is that it's a polar molecule. This is sort of the molecular makeup, or it's two hydrogens, one oxygen. And just the configuration of that, uh, the hydrogens essentially um, donate their extra electrons to the oxygen atom. And so the oxygen atom has a slightly more negative charge. Right? It pulls those electrons much harder than the hydrogen pulls those electrons to themselves. And so the oxygen has, sort of has a slightly negative charge. The, the hydrogen parts of the modern molecule have a slightly positive charge. And this polarity uh, allows for 
weak interactions between the molecules and also weak interactions between other polarized molecules like salts. This is the main reason that you can dissolve a salt in water, why we have salt water, right? That's because of this polar aspect of these molecules. The, these charges that are able to pull ions apart from each other allows for dissolution of things like minerals and salts in liquid. And those minerals and salts are the things that life uses for all its processes. So this polarized polarizability or polarized, polar nature of the molecule of water is really important for the transport of the chemical materials that life needs to grow and adapt and survive. So that's very unique about water. Uh, many other liquids, you know, solutions that we have here on Earth don't do this, right? If you try to do this in like, you know, I don't know, I think of a good nonpolar molecule. I think, well, vinegar is still a little, little polarized, but vinegar is a much weaker polar molecule, so it's very hard to dissolve things like, like salt and vinegar, for example, right? We don't get the same concentrations. So water is a very, uh, very unique molecule, and it's, it allows for a lot of the processes of life. Now, I should be specific, it's water in its liquid form that's most effective, right? When water is trapped in an ice lattice, it doesn't do this stuff. You can't dissolve ice, can't, sorry, you can't dissolve salt just on ice, right? The ice has to melt a little bit for the salt to dissolve. In fact, ice helps, uh, uh, salt helps ice melt a little bit. That's why we salt our roads out in the winter, right? But it needs to be liquid for that stuff to dissolve. So liquid water is really the important thing. And so looking out in our solar system, the thing that we're looking for are planets that allow liquid water to survive in some form. So Thursday, we're going to talk about how that happens in the outer solar system. But at least in the inner solar system, we are close enough to the sun where liquid water can be present just on the surface of the, of the planet, right? Obviously, that's true here on Earth because we have water present on the surface of our planet in its liquid form. Um, and water, of course, is a liquid between 273 and 373 Kelvin, 0 to 100 degrees Celsius, right? And so that sets sort of the temperature range at which you might expect to see water as a liquid on the surface of a given planet. Now, your homework assignment this week is focused on the sort of idea of what temperature corresponds to what distance from the sun. And it's like, related to the temperature of the sun the distance you are from the sun, that gives an idea of what the temperature is of the planet surface that you're on, right? But if you're on an area around the sun, a ring around the sun, in which that surface temperature is between 273 and 373 Kelvin, that means liquid water can be present on the surface. And that sets what's known as the habitable zone. Right? So the habitable zone of uh, around stars, right? The habitable planets that we've sort of mentioned in the past, are those planets that they reside at a certain distance from the sun, could be any different star, in which you can have liquid water, where the temperature is okay for liquid water. So this is a sort of schematic of where that zone is for our solar system. There's two colors here. There's a conservative estimate and an optimistic estimate. You're going to explore these a little bit in your homework assignment. But basically, this basically means, you know, you don't worry about the details of the atmosphere. It's either 273 or 373 Kelvin. That's where it is, right? It's a very restricted definition. Uh, we know, of course, that the Planets in the terrestrial zone have atmospheres that are a little bit hotter because of the greenhouse effect. So that kind of opens up the possibilities for more ranges of, of, uh, water, of where liquid water to exist. And so that's sort of the light area. And you can see that, you know, fortunately, and probably not surprisingly, the Earth's orbit is right in the habitable zone. It's actually a little scarily on the inner edge. And we'll talk about why that's a little scary based on how the sun evolves over time. But it's you know fairly solidly in there. But notice that Mars is also in at least the sort of more flexible habitable zone definition. So in principle, Mars could have liquid water on its surface given the right conditions. Venus is a little bit too hot, right? It's a little too close. But we'll talk about why Venus may have had water in its past. All right, so we talked all about Earth. So let's talk about this other planet that's in the habitable zone of our sun, and that's Mars. Right? Here's some of its sort of statistics. Right? It's uh, one and a half astronomical units from the sun, so it's about 50% further away from the sun than we are. Uh, and that makes its year about two years. You can just get that from Kepler's laws. Um, and remarkably, its day, which means the cycle at which it rotates around its axis, is almost identical to our Earth day. That's just a coincidence. I don't think there's any reason why Mars has to have the same day as we do. We'll talk about Venus does not have the same day as we do. It's completely different. 
but it just turns out that's the case. And then again, you know, in order to really get a feel of what the planet is made out of and what's going on, and you can look at its mass, which is about a tenth of our Earth, and its radius, which is about half the size. When you combine those with density, which is somewhere around 3.9 grams per cubic centimeter. Now, what does that tell us about what Mars is made out of? Yeah, so rock is roughly around 3 grams per cubic centimeter, and that's about 3 or 4, so probably mostly rock and, you know, a little bit of metal to bring that up beyond three. But this is a much more rocky planet than, for example, the Earth and Venus, which have higher, have higher densities. That's going to be critical for understanding how Mars has evolved over time. Now, the idea that Mars could be a haven for life is not an old idea, of course. Um, uh, let's see, this is, the, this is not 1988, this is actually done in 1788. Um, this is a map uh, made by Giovanni Ciparelli. Uh, the person who looked at Mars, you know, a lot of the astronomers at the time you know, you would look through your, your telescope, and you don't have cameras at the time, so mostly they sort of sketch what they see. So these are maps that, that Schiarelli sketched over many, many days of what he saw on the surface of Mars. And what he saw in his eyes were Mosser, all right, water. He saw areas that looked like they were smooth and speculated that these are actually all oceans. And that in between these little land areas, there were little canali or canals. And this sort of starts the idea that maybe Mars has water, and maybe Mars has canals. And if Mars has canals, the canals we have here on Earth are built by intelligent people, right? Human beings. So this really got people excited about the possibility that maybe Mars is inhabited by Martian life, by Martian civilization. Um, this is later on. This is uh, uh, work by Christopher Lowell, who is really the person who probably popularized the idea of Mars being a place that has Martian civilizations. Um, he was looking at a better telescope. This is probably what he saw on Mars with his eyes, but this is what he drew, right? <coughs> the shadings and everything like that. Bless you again. What he drew were all these beautifully straight geometric lines that he believed he saw on the surface of Mars, which looked, you know, kind of like complex transport systems, canals. Maybe this is how the Martians transport water from the poles to this, the equators where they live, right? Who knows? Maybe this is their superhighways. Who knows? Right. It turns out that probably what Percival was, Lowell was seeing was the inside of his eyeball. We have veins and arteries, little capillaries that go through our eyes, and when you stare at a bright light, don't do it now because you'll be blind for a while, but if you stare at a bright light for long enough, you'll start to see little lines etched into that light. If you stare into a telescope at one spot on a bright Mars for long enough, you start to see lines on it. It's just the lines in your eyes, it turns out. All right. So these are some of the limitations of you know, human measurement of things. We have our own sort of biases just because we have bodies. Right? So Prismal probably didn't really see lines, he just saw his own, you know, lines in his eyes. But that really stimulated a lot of imagination about what those Martians could be and whether they were good Martians or bad Martians. A lot of the early science fiction, um, both in terms of, of written science fiction, but also in, um, in film and in, in, in TV and stuff like that. Uh, this is actually a, a picture from one of the first movies uh, ever developed. This is actually a movie developed in Russia. And it was based on a book by Tolstoy called The Queen of Mars. Right? Uh, and of course, many of you know the War of the Worlds sort of whole thing. There was, you know, now been several movies. There was this great radio drama that happened back in the 1930s that scared the wits out of everyone. Right? These are all based on the idea that Mars has a civilization of advanced aliens. and they may not really like us and may want our water or something like that, right? All sorts of things about that. Okay, so in any case, uh, we know that Martians don't exist, at least in these forms. Um, we've sent several missions to Mars over the last uh, several decades. Um, this is just a snapshot of the, the 50 missions that have been sent by various countries. You can see their flags all across here, China, United States, Russia. Um, I should say only about 20 out of 50 of these, so 40% have made it, 42% have made it, right? Not a very good track record for sending, you know, billion dollar spacecraft to other planets. Um, but, you know, it's hard work. Uh, but many of these have brought back a lot of great information. We know a lot more about Mars than we did, certainly since Crystal Knowles. Um, the one uh, mission that's on there now, which several of you have brought up in your news reports already, is the Mars Curiosity rover. Um, I should point back to this picture, and these are all sort of the different landers or rovers that have landed uh, on Mars. 
And Mars Curiosity is by far the largest. It's about the size of an SUV. It's got, so you can see the kind of picture here, and there's some people there. So this is a pretty big device to land on another planet. But it is going, it's been going around for the last uh, three or four years now, uh, examining the environment, looking at the geology, looking at evidence of past water, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and um, also looking for some isotopic signatures of life that we'll talk about in just a little bit. All right, lots of things that this, this rover is doing to sort of map out what's really going on on the surface of Mars. All right, so what do we know about it today? Well, um, so we've talked about sort of the large geological aspects of planets are important for whether life, you know, the sort of carbon cycle, the energy cycle, whether life can exist on it. Um, what we know about Mars right now is that there's no geological activity, there's no earthquakes, there's no volcanic activity, there's no tectonic plate motion. All right, all the geological activity seems to be shut off by now, but there's certainly evidence that there was a lot of volcanism in the past. Um, right now it has a very thin atmosphere, right? Less than a percent of the Earth's atmosphere, and most of it is carbon dioxide, right? Totally unlike our atmosphere. And because it's so far away from the sun, and because it has such a thin atmosphere, it's extremely cold, right? So its surface temperatures have a range, of course, it depends whether you're under the sun at noon or whether you're at the poles in the winter and stuff like that. You can go anywhere from minus 55 degrees all the way up to 27 degrees Celsius, just 81 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a nice warm day. It's actually not too bad. Unfortunately, it doesn't last very long. Right? This only happens in the Mars summer when it's closest to the sun and it's high noon. Right? So there's a wide range of temperatures. This is not so great. This is OK. But you know, it means that if you have water on the surface, it should be liquid at least part of the time. And then, of course, it would hard freeze when it gets down to these very low temperatures. But in principle, it is certainly in the range where you would expect to have liquid water on the surface, at least for short periods of time. Um, now, the geology is, is unusual, all right? Our Earth is fairly smooth, except for some like sort of mountain ranges that happen at tectonic plate activities. Mars has this extreme dichotomy, all right? The, um, this is the sort of northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere here. You can see very clearly this is, uh, this is showing an altitude map. So these dark colors are low altitude. These upper colors are very high altitude. And it seems like Mars is kind of an asymmetric top, right? It's got a bottom heavy. It's like a low, heavy bottom and a sort of light top that seems very smooth. Um, hopefully, by now, you know that things that are smooth means there must have been some recent uh, volcanic activity, right, that sort of paved over lots of stuff, right? Smooth means not many craters. So if you have not many craters, it means those craters have been wiped away by something. And there's not a lot of weathering on Mars because it has no atmosphere. And so that we think much of this sort of smoothness is because of volcanism that's happened in the recent past. And then these sort of very high points right here, these are the, um, the Tharsis uh, Mountains, the Tharsis Volcanoes, uh, which we'll talk about just a little bit. So all of this is a very unusual topology, and we think a lot of that's just due to um, the sort of impact history of Mars. Things have been hitting it for lots of, you know, many billions of years, just like Earth. But because Earth doesn't have the weathering processes that Earth does, it sort of retained the sort of asymmetries that happened from all these impacts. Um, so I've pointed out these volcanoes here. You can see these directly from the surface. Here's another picture of it. This is uh, Mount Olympus. This is the largest volcano in the entire solar system. And it forms very much in the same way that uh, the sort of uh, Pacific Island or the inter-island uh, volcanoes uh, form here on Earth. All right? So Mauna Kea is, by mass, the largest mountain on the planet if you go from the ocean floor. Right, I have to go from the surface level to Everest, but if you go from ocean floor, Mount Kea is the biggest, the biggest uh, volcano we have. And Olympus is way much bigger than that. Right, 20, 26 uh, kilometers at the, at, the, at the surface. Basically, the, the peak of the mountain sticks out into space. Right? This is much higher than most of the atmosphere. Um, and it's because, and it's and really big also, it takes up about the size of Arizona if you put it, put it on Arizona. Um, and it's so big because, uh, where we have the Hawaiian Islands that have sort of these volcanic spots, those spots keep putting out lava, but then the plate moves over. And so what starts off as, you know, all the lava coming out here, this whole plate is moving in this direction, so then you start just peppering little islands. In the case of Mars, we don't think there was much in the way of plate tectonics. And so just that little amount of volcanic activity over billions of years just builds a really big volcano adds and adds and adds until you get this really massive thing. So 
just the you know the presence of this really big volcano tells us two things. One, there is some tectonic activity because volcanism happens. There is some heating happening inside the core of, the, of Mars, at least there was in the past. It also tells us that plate tectonics was not something that was common on Mars. Right? The plates just didn't move around. So any volcanic activity just kind of added more and more to the same place. Another interesting feature is this uh, feature you can again see just from space. This is Valles Marineris. This is the largest canyon in the solar system. It's larger, it's wider than the United States, right? So Grand Canyon means nothing compared to this, right? And it's incredibly deep, right? The, the canyon down here is something like 30 or 40 kilometers from, from top to bottom. So these are tremendously large features, and it's even bigger to think because Mars is, again, smaller than the Earth. It's about half the size. And yet it has these much bigger volcanic and uh, sort of canyon-like features in them. And that suggests there was a lot of tectonic activity at some point in the past. Now, uh, I mentioned the atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide. So where's, where's the oxygen? Well, it turns out most of the oxygen in Mars is bound up uh, not in the atmosphere, but it's bound up in the rocks. Right? And that's what gives Mars this reddish color. It's actually literally rust in the soil. All right, the oxygen that would normally be in the air, at least here on the planet, has formed iron oxides uh, on, the, on the surface. And it's actually not too different from the iron oxides that we see in fossils, fossilized rocks from about three to four billion years ago. About the time that photosynthetic organisms start producing oxygen in the atmosphere, most of the oxygen goes right into rusting rocks, all right, combining with iron in the rocks. Up until the point where all the iron is then oxidized, and the oxygen starts pouring in into the atmosphere. So that tells us two things. One really potentially very exciting one is that if there's all of this oxygen in the rocks of Mars, it suggests that at some point oxygen may have been available up in the atmosphere. And we think that oxygen was, is present in our atmosphere because of living organisms, because of photosynthetic organisms. It's part of the sort of waste product of converting sunlight into carbohydrates. Right? So, that suggests, so this is not the only possibility, that perhaps there were some organisms that were producing oxygen very early on in, Earth, in Mars' history, and that actually got locked up into the rocks. Who knows? Uh, we also know that Mars has, does have ice on its surface, and it's at mostly carbon dioxide ice, so it has seasons just like the Earth has seasons. In fact, it has more extreme seasons because it's tilted over more than the Earth is. Um, and it has these sort of ice caps, these polar ice caps that form on a seasonal basis. Now, most of this ice is actually carbon dioxide. It's literally the air freezing out, because remember the air is mostly carbon dioxide on Mars. Um, and it has sort of a cycle on its own as it freezes out and then the summer uh, goes back into the atmosphere. So we have a variation in the atmospheric pressure that goes on a yearly cycle as well. But there is water ice on the surface. And this is one of the most exciting discoveries of this particular lander, Phoenix lander, back in 2008. Um, very complex experiment. It stuck its wheel in the ground and it spun it. <laughs> that was its ability to dig. All right. The current lander has an actual drill. It can go deep in. It can pull stuff out. Right. It can make holes and like that. Uh, you know, earlier landers didn't have quite the same tools, so they just spun wheels to see what was underneath them. And what was underneath them in this particular case, and this is a the lander actually went close to the pole, so it was much colder uh, part of the planet. When it spun its wheels, it actually discovered that what was underneath the soil was water ice. It wasn't carbon dioxide, it was actually water ice. And they could watch the water ice sublimate, right, directly from solid into gas in the air over the course of a few days. This is the first detection of water, uh, actual, like, physical detection of water on any planet outside the Earth. This is made back in 2008. And since then, actually, water ice has been found in other places. And so uh, just a few years ago by this uh, Indian um, satellite, uh, Chandrayaan-1, which landed on the moon, they found evidence of water ice on the moon. Uh, and we know that water ice, ironically, is actually present on Mercury, which seems crazy because Mercury is right against the sun. But in just the shadows of craters where the sun doesn't make it, you have these very small traces of water ice. So probably not as useful. This is very exciting for people who want to do lunar settlements because it means there may be some local water that they can tap into. And of course, having subsurface ice on Mars is really exciting, not just because it may mean there's a source of water on the planet, but it may mean that underneath that ice, there may be a place where organisms can survive with some kind of liquid form of ice, a liquid form of water. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so water is there, 
why is it only solid or gas? Well, this has a lot to do with the atmospheric pressure. Um, you've probably seen these kind of pressure temperature uh, diagrams in your chemistry classes. This sort of determines whether a given substance is a solid, liquid, or gas. You have this sort of classic sort of triple point diagram here. Here's the triple point right here. Um, and where Earth is, the sort of range at which the temperature on the surface of the Earth varies, you can go all the way from, you know, if the poles where you have, it's cold enough to have just solid ice on the surface, up into the, you know, liquid zone. And you can even have places like the centers of volcanoes, for example, where it's so hot that that liquid water would actually evaporate, right? Earth can sort of, sort of span all these different ranges, but it has a range in which water can be liquid. The pressure at Mars is, is strangely just at the triple point, which means that even when it gets warm enough to, you know, where you'd expect to have liquid water, it's actually not at the point where liquids can exist. It can only exist in either gas or solid form. So instead of going from gas to liquid, it goes to gas directly to gas. Sorry, solid directly to gas. It sublimates right at that pressure. So it's really the pressure of Mars that keeps it so dry. Um, it's not the absence of water. There seems to be plenty of water around. It's just it's too low atmosphere, and so it can't form a liquid liquid form. All right. So, however, all of the images that we've been taking of Mars over the last forty years make it pretty clear that at some point in Mars's past, there had to have been liquid water on the surface because we see all sorts of different features that look like water features. So, um, this is an example of a picture from the Viking lander back in nineteen seventy seven, where you can see these very clear kind of rivulet. Uh, delta formations, those can only happen from flowing liquid on the surface. And the only flowing liquid that can exist at the conditions of Mars is water. So at some point in the past, this is evidence that water had to be flowing across the surface. Um, here's another example, these sort of bends that we see in some of the sand uh, dunes are exactly the same kind of meandering rivers formations that we see in very old rivers. Uh, so, for example, in, in the southeast United States, right? Those are rivers that have been flowing for lots of, you know, many, many thousands of years. So to have meandering features means that water model wasn't just something that happened spontaneously for a short period of time. There had to be steadily flowing water for long periods of time to make these kind of features in the soil. Right? So lots of evidence that water has been there in the past. Uh, okay, so here's a, here's just a quick, let's see if we can identify. Which one of these is Earth, which one is Mars? Which one of these is Earth? Who says A? Who says B? Who says C? Okay, I think the C's have it. Uh, it is indeed C. Now what gives it away? Obviously A is Mars because it's too low resolution. So it looks like something that was pieced together in space, okay. <laughs> All right. Why not B? <laughs> well, B looks like Earth because it's more detailed. Well, not to say more detailed, but there's more uh, like little canals here and there. And it looks like there's there rather than you know, no, no, no. rather than this one, which looks like they're kind of dried up. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, this one's really big. This is dry. It and looks. Like, so it's kind of, yeah, it looks kind of dry. I don't know. I'm thinking about, like, we have to say things, but it's, like, more, um, Moist? Yeah, moist, or it's just, like, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Tatiana? I, I agree with that, too, but it kind of looks like this part on the bottom right corner of Earth is kind of water, and everything there. Do you see, like, you know that thick black line? Well, this thing right here? Yeah, but yeah. then it's a little inward that way. It's, like that's water. Mm -hmm. Well, and the B Mars, it looks like it's um, there's no really distinction between like the land and then the water, I guess, but in the earth, it kind of looks like okay. So, kind of coloration, yeah. You can see like the same craters, yeah. This to me is the dead giveaway craters. How many craters do you see just walking around in the earth? <laughs> Not many. I mean, there's a few like air, you know, there's meteor crater out in Arizona. Right? That's actually a fairly old crater. But you know, random craters all over the place. We don't see a lot of craters on Earth because craters are weathered away by the atmosphere. But Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere. And so the craters that we see on Mars are, are persist. Right? They stay put. And they even if they impact after this sort of period where there is water on the planet, you know, they're still there. 
right? They don't go their way. So, you know, you can see craters in this one, you can see craters in this one, not many craters here. Right? It's because they've been weathered away. All right. Uh, you want to try again? Which one is Earth? A, B, C. Oh, you voted twice. <laughs> oh, there's only one. Oh, C, okay. Why C? Because everyone voted C. It was like a grand game. Yeah, <laughs> it is a grand game. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we can color it's it. Black and white. Yeah, yeah, it's black and white. So black and white is just tricky a little bit, but coloring it's pretty obvious because now the water stands out as a different color than that, where there's actually no water here. But, you know, look at the formations, right? You have these sort of, you know, sedimentary layers that have been weathered down in several separate ways. As color flowed through here, it's dug in, and it's allowed, you know, these sort of sedimentary layers to be revealed. And you have exactly the same sedimentary layers here on Mars. Now, sedimentary layers are made of sediments, right? Minerals that are laid down by liquid substances. So to have these kind of sedimentary layers on Mars indicates not, again, not just flowing water, but long-standing flowing water that could lay down many, many layers of, of you know, sort of dissolved minerals into the ground. So all of the evidence we've seen from at least the geology suggests that there was water, abundant water on Mars in the past. Um, some of the small scale geology, like these kind of minerals, magnetite, and these things that are called blueberries, right? They're made of some sort of minerals that sort of form these circles. All, both of these things require water to form in the first place. There are some minerals that only form in water. And we're finding these minerals on Mars. Um, here's another example. This is a vein of calcium uh, and sulfur. Um, if you know, if anyone here a miner, not a miner like you're young, but like a miner, you go on the ground and you mine things. No, okay. Have uh, you, you ever had a chance to mine in your life, or go spelunking or something like that? Um, you see these sort of veins of different minerals in the in the cave systems, and they're laid down by water. Right, they're seeped in by water. They condense out. And you get these sort of beautiful veins of gold and silver and other stuff that's not as valuable. All right? That all happens because of the water. So there's another thing. So there's all, again, all this evidence that points that Mars had to have water at some point. Uh, here's a nice little clear artist sketch of what that might have looked like. And the idea is that at some point early on, Mars had a thicker atmosphere. All right? And that thicker atmosphere, the pressure was high enough that you could actually make liquid water. So here's Mars today. If we imagine that in the past, all right, volcanoes would have pumped out the carbon dioxide we see today, but there may have been much more of these carbon dioxide because there was much more volcanic activity. That carbon dioxide would have raised the pressure, and it also would have increased the greenhouse gas. And you could have had a Mars that lived in this area right here, where there'd be no problem to have liquid water at the surface over a wide range of temperatures. So the chemistry and the geology indicate that at some point in the past, Mars was a perfectly great place for life because it had plenty of liquid water on its surface. In fact, we still see that there's plenty of water. It's just locked up at ice today. So what happened? What killed Mars? What killed it about 3.8 billion years ago? Well, uh, I mentioned this average density that it's more like rock than metals. And remember that what is the, what is the thing that powers tectonic activity inside the Earth? Radioactivity. Radioactivity, yeah. That's the main energy source for tectonic activity in the Earth. And what types of things are radioactive? Is it, is it, is it ices, rocks, or metals? Metals. metals all right? So the fact that the Earth has a very high density, which means it has a high concentration of metals, those metals contain many more radioactive substances, and those radioactive substances provide the heat that keep the Earth hot and inside the tectonic activity going on. Because this has fewer metals, the, it has, has had less radioactivity over the course of its, of its time, and the radioactive heating has basically died off. And so without that heating, you don't have the same volcanism or tectonics anymore. And without the volcanism, you lose the carbon dioxide being outgassed in the atmosphere, and that makes the atmosphere much thinner. Now you're down to a very low pressure atmosphere that can't sustain water on the surface. Right? So this is a nice direct connection between what's happening on the inside of the planet what happens on the surface of the planet. When you lose this geological activity, you lose the atmosphere. Now, what do you lose the atmosphere to? Uh, the other thing that uh, tectonic, so there was three forms of tectonic activity. There was volcanism, there was tectonic plates, and there was one more 
manifestation of tectonic activity. Anybody remember that? The magnetic field. Yes, the magnetic fields. All right, so the motion of the interior of the planet generates these <coughs> magnetic fields that extend around the planet and protect it from the solar wind. So when this goes away, that means the magnetic field also goes away. And Mars has an extremely weak magnetic field today, just kind of patchy magnetic fields in places. But in the past, the magnetic field probably was strong enough to block out the solar wind and protect the atmosphere. When this goes away, that wind will come in. Right? It's not just a blowing wind. It's charged plasma particles coming from the sun at high speeds. That's enough to rip off the upper layers of the atmosphere and do this over billions of years, and you eventually end up with a very, very small atmosphere. That's what we think happens happened to, to Mars. Now the other the third thing is that um, with all the oxygen in the rocks, UV radiation actually becomes a problem. So you know, we are actually more than sort of the breathing of the air, we are very beholden to our photosynthetic uh, colleagues because the oxygen that they produce forms ozone in the upper atmosphere. And ozone is an absorber of ultraviolet radiation. Without that ultraviolet radiation protection, we would be mutating like crazy, right? We would have skin cancers like you wouldn't believe, right? Um, but it's not just sort of biological material that's affected by UV radiation. The UV light from the sun is enough to literally break open, break apart uh, water into its basic molecules, water, hydrogen, and oxygen. We actually did that little experiment with the battery early on in the course, right? There's enough energy in ultraviolet to do that just blanket on the atmosphere. And the oxygen will, of course, come down and get buried in the rocks. The hydrogen is light, and with this very small planet, it just floats away. Right? Very much like the hydrogen in our atmosphere just floats away. Right? Hydrogen is so light, it just, just leaves. So you lose this, you lose this, and you end up with a very dry and very hydrogen poor uh, atmosphere that today wouldn't actually be able to form a lot of water because there's not a lot of hydrogen left to combine with the oxygen that's in the rocks. Okay. So all of these processes happen to essentially kill this planet, at least kill it from the perspective of having life. But there's enough evidence that life was there, at least it's, uh, the, the conditions of life were there at some point in the past. All right. All right, now. Uh, so I have time. I want to talk a little bit about this other planet, Venus, right? Cloudy hell. Right? Venus is closer to the Earth, about 70% uh, about uh, closer to the sun than the Earth is. Uh, accordingly, it has a much shorter year. But look at this crazy day. Right? It has a 243 day day. All right? 243 of our days is one of Venus. It's, back, it's rotating so slowly, it's actually kind of rotating backwards. And so the sun over the course of about 250 days, rises in the west and sets in the east. But it's a pretty slow process. And you wouldn't be able to see it because the atmosphere is so thick you can't actually see through the atmosphere. Um, we're not quite sure why Venus is rotating so slowly. Um, most of the sort of understanding of how, how planets uh, accrete and shrink would suggest the planet should rotate quite quickly. It suggests that Venus may have been hit by something early in the past. It kind of just hit at just the right angle, kind of stopped it spinning. Um, this is still a mystery we don't quite understand. Um, but otherwise, it's very similar, at least in terms of its, its size and density. Right? Very similar to Earth in size, very similar to Earth in density, which means it has the same compositions. But its atmosphere is incredibly different, and much more like uh, Mars, it turns out. Right? It's mostly carbon dioxide with a little nitrogen, and then sort of a little bit of sort of trace gases, including hydrogen chloride. Hydrogen chloride gas, not a great place to, to spend your vacation. And it has so much of these gases that it's about 100 times the Earth's atmospheric pressure, a much, much, much denser, much thicker atmosphere. And as a result, we can't actually see to the surface in optical <coughs> light. It completely blocks all of the optical light. We can literally not look down and see the surface of Venus. But we can look at it at different wavelengths. And so we can get radar maps. Radar is a form of radio radiation. And we can see the surface by mapping out radar. And what we see is a very uh, geologically active surface. There's lots of volcanoes. Uh, there's lots of what look like very fresh volcanoes, and in fact, we think Venus is still undergoing volcanic activity today. And that's probably not too surprising given its high density, very much like Earth's. It probably has enough heat in its interior to generate this, like, this uh, volcanic activity. Now, we have landed things on Venus. The Russians, in particular, have been kind of keen on Venus for many decades, so they've sent several uh, uh, landers onto the surface. They last for about like 10 minutes. 
because it's 700 degrees Fahrenheit, 700 degrees Kelvin, and it's 100 times the atmospheric pressure, and things just kind of melt. So uh, we had a few sort of pictures, but you know, not much. And you know, it's a surface that doesn't look too hospitable. All right, it looks very rocky. Um, it looks very rough, which means there's not a lot of weathering going on, which is actually surprising given how thick the atmosphere is. But it tells us the atmosphere is not really moving very much. And it also means there's not a lot of liquid substance around to cause the weathering to happen. Right? So even though Venus has this hugely thick atmosphere, it appears to be dry at the surface. Right? It's cloudy with no rain. Kind of like San Diego most of the time. Right? Now we have sent, so Russians have sent a few things down on the surface, but most of our observations have been around uh, in, in, in orbits. Uh, one of the most recent um, uh, sat missions was the Venus Express, which actually just finished up a couple of years ago. Um, they discovered that Venus has an ozone layer, so there's oxygen in the atmosphere that's creating the ozone. So there's a protection against UV radiation. Uh, there is some weather in the upper atmosphere, so they detected lightning storms and lightning uh, flashes in the atmosphere. Um, Interesting, we'll talk about in this moment, that there's evidence that there was oceans at some point on Venus, and that there's still active volcanism. So that's consistent with this very dense interior. All right. Now, I talked about Mars having the largest volcano in the solar system, but Venus actually has the most volcanoes in the solar system, all right? Far more than Earth, um, and more than any other planet in the solar system. And again, it suggests that there's volcanoes that are actually still active today. But most of, uh, probably the most interesting thing is when we look at the surface of Venus, a lot of it is still relatively smooth. And that again suggests that there was some massive volcanic event that happened about 750 million years ago that literally repaved the entire surface. Now this sucks if you're looking for past evidence of life on Venus, because if it's there, it's been buried by volcanic lava. It's probably not good for it, right? So, um, you know, landing on Venus and looking for bugs is probably not something that's gonna be very fruitful. But we can uh, look at evidence of other uh, ev past evidence of things like oceans. And one of the ways we can do that is look at uh, stuff like the kind of minerals that we see on the surface of Venus, which you can determine from spectroscopy. And it turns out there are huge sections of Venus, these things in red here, that are made of granite. And granite is present here on Earth. Granite is a mineral that's formed in the presence of water. Right? So you can't make these sort of continents of granite without having some kind of water present in the past. So the thinking is that Venus, at some point in its early history, had liquid water on its surface. Right? There's another artist's rendition if you want to picture Venus as a nice, you know, tropical place to go visit. Notice that there's no vegetation because this has been early on where there's no vegetables. Um, but Venus is so close to the sun, how could it be that hot and still have water? Well, the argument actually is that the sun has not something that's actually been stable all through its history. The sun has actually gotten brighter as it's gotten older. This is something called the faint young sun paradox. And this has to do with how the sun converts hydrogen into helium. When the sun first formed, there was tons of hydrogen around. It can just burn up a little bit, and it was able to support its own structure. And, produce enough light, and it was a much lower level of light. But as that hydrogen is being converted into helium, there's less fuel available. And so those reactions actually have to get more uh, vigorous, which means they produce more light, which means there's more light coming off the sun, which means the sun's hotter. And so this is a model of what the sun's luminosity has done over the past uh, four and a half billion years. So there it is today, and in the past, at the four billion years, maybe been 65, 70% as bright. Um, and when it's this much lower luminosity, right, less light coming out, less energy coming out, that means that the temperature of the planet close to the sun is actually also going to get colder. So while Venus is too hot today, we think that in the past, Venus may have actually been in this habitable zone area, or at least within the inner edge of the habitable zone area. Yes, ma'am. That's the scary part that I mentioned later on, right? So I mentioned that Earth is at the sort of inner edge of the habitable zone today. The sun is just going to get brighter and brighter. Here's Earth in five billion years. That's where Venus is today. That's bad. <laughs> yeah, then we can move to Mars. Mars is great. We make the atmosphere a little more pressure, but it's great. So um, 
Yeah, so being on the inner edge is actually a bad thing because stars, all stars get hotter as they get older. And so Venus probably was a great place, perfectly hospitable early on. And we were actually probably a little cold, uh, but you know, Venus got too hot. Now I say this is a faint young sun paradox because actually this is what you'd expect the Earth's temperature to be based on the sun's luminosity. And um, this is actually what we've been over the course of the history of the Earth. Nobody really understands why we've actually stayed at a very stable temperature. We think part of the reason is actually lots of carbon dioxide early on, and then life kicked in at just the right time to make methane. And methane is a very powerful, uh, potent greenhouse gas. And that may have stabilized the atmosphere. So ironically, life stabilized the atmosphere for life. But it doesn't actually have to be that way. Okay, so, uh, but of course we know that Venus, you know, because of its atmosphere, now has this terrible runaway greenhouse effect, right? All the carbon dioxide, that the 96% of the carbon dioxide that's in there is trapping all of the, almost all the radiation that's coming from the surface. And as a result, the water evaporates, the water gas is a greenhouse, a ga a greenhouse gas, so it also makes it too hot. And essentially you have this effect where you can never get back to a wet atmosphere, or sorry, a wet surface. Now. The water should still be there, right? In the atmosphere, well, it turns out that's probably also not true because even though there is some ozone in the, in the atmosphere of, of Venus, that water is sort of circulated up throughout the whole atmosphere, and UV light is still interacting with it and breaking up those molecules. And just like Mars, the hydrogen is being stripped away, and the oxygen is actually not being absorbed into rocks, but it's being absorbed into things like sulfur dioxide and, and sulfur chloric oxide and stuff like that. So Venus and Mars are both hydrogen poor atmospheres largely because of the UV radiation that's hitting them. And of course, Venus is closer to the sun, so it gets a lot more UV radiation. So uh, this is sort of the picture that we have of, of our three terrestrial worlds. At some point in the past, all three have evidence of having water on their surfaces. All right? Clearly, Earth does have water, and it, it looks like it did for a long period of time. We have evidence that Venus had water on its surface at some early point. We have evidence that Mars had tons of water on its surface, at least up to about 3.8 billion years ago. And what happened? Well, Venus has this thick carbon dioxide atmosphere, so it has a runaway greenhouse effect that absorbs, that evaporates all the water from the surface. That water gets destroyed by UV. And then it turns out that the atmosphere is still being stripped, not because of, <coughs> Venus also requires a very fast rotation rate. Because it has no rotation rate, it has no magnetic field, it's being bombarded by solar wind particles as well. So as a result, you get a hot but dry world. Mars had something similar. It had a thin carbon dioxide atmosphere, so the greenhouse wasn't a big deal. But because it's so small, it loses all the tectonic activity. And that makes the atmosphere much thinner. That shuts down the magnetic field. You get UV radiation breaking down the water. And you also get the solar wind stripping away the atmosphere. And so Mars goes to a cold, dry world. And it's only the Earth that has just the right combination of temperature, the right combination of carbon dioxide. Uh, eventually, you get photosynthesis. It creates ozone layer that protects the atmosphere from UV light. And you have a magnetic field that protects the atmosphere from being stripped away. All of these things were required for Earth to have the habitat it has today and appear to be basically the same or whatever. But three places that all three could have been a nice, wonderful planet for life to evolve because it has water, and only the Earth makes it. This is something that we'll come back to again when we think about. What is the likelihood that we'll find other worlds out in, this, in the sort of universe that even if they're in the habitable zones, actually end up looking like a planet like Earth? Okay. Any questions? Okay, uh, so I'll see you on Thursday. Don't forget there's, a, there's no lab tomorrow, but there will be a problem session, the usual problem session at 7 o'clock? Yeah, 7 o'clock? Uh, yes. So, we're supposed to do a lab and discussion class, so there's no discussion tomorrow. There's no discussion, no lab tomorrow. Okay. Nothing at 4 o'clock tomorrow. Don't show up at 4 o'clock. Or if you show up, leave.